Hello, everyone. I'm Linda Sims. I'm the Director of Media Relations for the Canada Pension Plan Investment Board, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2012 public meeting of the CPP Investment Board. Now, for those of you who have attended a meeting in the past, you'll notice that we're doing things a little differently. This year, we're bringing together Canadians from coast to coast to one public meeting that is being held live in nine different locations across the country and on our website. The webcast is an effective way to reach more Canadians and it uh, allows our presentation to be made more accessible for those who are unable to travel or to take time off work to come to the meeting in person. Welcome to all of you at our various live locations and those who are watching via our webcast at www.cppib.ca. We hold public meetings every two years in each of the nine provinces that participate in the CPP. It gives us an opportunity to speak directly to Canadians, to tell them how we're managing the CPP fund, and to give them the opportunity to ask us questions about the CPP Investment Board. Here with me today is Bob Astley. He is the Chair of the Board of Directors of the Canada Kenshin Plan Investment Board and our President and CEO, David Dennison. Bob and David will provide some background for our, of our organization as well as an update on our recent activities. Now, throughout the broadcast, you'll hear Bob and David refer to the CPPIB. This is just a short form for the CPP Investment Board. After the presentation, we'll have time for questions. You can submit questions by either speaking directly to one of the CPPIB representatives at your location, or by filling out a question card and handing it to them, or if you're watching via the website, you can simply type your question into the comments section on the screen. Now I'll hand over to Bob so we can get started. Thank you Linda. Hello and welcome everyone. We are holding this public meeting following another successful fiscal year for the CPP Investment Board. At March 31st, 2012, which was the end of the fiscal year, assets within the CPP fund were at an all-time high of $161.6 billion. We know that people question whether CPP retirement benefits will be available for all of us when we retire. The existence, size, and projected growth of the CPP fund are important reasons why the answer to the question is a resounding yes. The CPP is financially sound and secure. No doubt you will have heard a lot of news over the past year about changes to the other types of Canadian retirement benefits, old age security and the guaranteed income supplement. Old age security and GIS are quite separate and distinct from Canada Pension Plan benefits. Changes to old age security and the guaranteed income supplement do not affect your Canada Pension Plan benefits. The Chief Actuary of Canada the individual responsible for providing an expert assessment of the sustainability of the CPP continues to confirm that the CPP is sustainable over the 75-year period he analyzes, even taking into account factors such as increasing lifespans and aging demographic trends in Canada. Our mandate is to assist the CPP by earning a maximum rate of return without undue risk of loss. We are pleased that over the past 10 years, we have met the 4.0% real rate of return required of us in that regard. According to the Chief Actuary's assumptions, assets are projected to reach $300 billion within the next decade and nearly half a trillion dollars in the next 20 years. One of the reasons for that rapid growth is that the money that is in the CPP fund right now, all $161.6 billion of it, is not actually needed to pay current benefits. It is not until 2021 that a small portion of annual investment income will be needed to help pay pensions. 
even after that date. The CPP fund will continue to grow, but at a more modest rate. We as a country have a sustainable national pension plan at a time when many other countries around the world struggle with pension funding problems. Fifteen years ago, our federal and provincial governments came together to make some tough decisions. This was to ensure that Canada would be prepared for demographic changes that would result in an increased proportion of retirees receiving benefits versus workers making contributions. The CPPIB was established as a result of those reforms. Designed as an independent investment management organization whose sole purpose is to invest the assets of the Canada Pension Plan not required to pay current benefits. Now, a key concern raised by Canadians at the time of our creation was that safeguards be put in place to ensure that the CPPIB would operate free of government involvement, but with a high degree of accountability. Our governance model sets out the way in which the CPP is, CPPIB is managed and overseen. It specifies what we can and cannot do, as well as rigorous disclosure practices. The CPPIB's governance model strikes a balance between independence and accountability to ensure we operate at arm's length from government with strong oversight. This balance is very important. We need to be independent to ensure that our only priority is to invest the CPP Fund's assets to help secure the retirement benefits for 18 million Canadians. At the same time, we need to be open, transparent, and accountable to the contributors and beneficiaries of the CPP. That accountability is accomplished by our frequent reports and meetings with the Federal Finance Minister and the finance ministers of each of the participating provinces who collectively act as stewards of the CPP on behalf of its participants. We are also committed to continuous and timely disclosure of our, of our investment activities and financial performance. You just need to visit our website at www.cppib.ca to find regular updates on everything from the CPP Fund's performance to the companies we have invested in to news releases about recent investments or to how we exercise our rights to vote as shareholders of companies. Once a year, independent auditors conduct, conduct an extensive audit of all aspects of our finances and investment results and we produce a detailed annual report of all of our activities that is tabled in Parliament by the Federal Minister of Finance. Copies of our recent report are available in each of today's meeting sites as well as on our website. I encourage those who are interested to read through it. There is an extensive review of the CPP which is conducted by the Federal and Provincial Finance Ministers and the Chief Actuary of Canada every three years. We are also subject to a special examination of all our records, systems and practices every six years. In terms of oversight, a professional, qualified and independent board of directors that I have the privilege of chairing works with management to map out CPPIB's strategic direction and to make critical operating decisions such as hiring the CEO and approving investment, risk management, compensation and other policies. The mandate formulated for CPPIB at the time of its creation is clear and singular to maximize investment returns without excessive risk. We are not permitted to do anything that is inconsistent with this mandate, nor can the assets of the CPP fund be used for any other purpose than the needs of the Canada Pension Plan. The clarity and strength 
of CPPIB's governance model have been demonstrated throughout its 12 years of operations. And that model has received international praise from leading global organizations such as the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the United States Congress, and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. In addition, earlier this year, The Economist, a highly respected global publication, highlighted the success of Canadian pension funds, citing governance as a key attribute to success. I will now hand over to CEO David Dennison, who will provide some information about the organization and the CPP Fund's performance. David? Thanks very much, Bob, and uh, hello to all of you. My job as the CEO of the CPP Investment Board is to lead a team to make investment decisions that will help to sustain the CPP for future generations. I'm very pleased to report that during fiscal 2012, the CPP fund increased by $13.4 billion. Nearly $10 billion of that increase was from the net investment income generated by our many investment programs across CPPIB. And this represents a 6.6% rate of return for the fiscal year. Now, while it's of course important to report annual results, long-term results for the CPP fund are more relevant and indicative of sustainability for a multi-generational plan such as the CPP. Over the last 10 years, our annualized rate of return was 6.2% which, as Bob mentioned earlier, is consistent with the real or pre-inflation return target of 4% that the Chief Actuary of Canada estimates is needed over a 75-year period to sustain the CPP at its current contribution rate. The CPPIB has generated nearly $60 billion in investment income in the past 10 years. In other words, almost 37% of the CPP fund's current assets of $161.6 billion are due to investment results, which demonstrates the, the benefit of compounding returns over periods of time. Now, before CPPIB began operating back in 1999, Any surplus assets of the CPP fund were simply invested in government bonds. And while an all-bond portfolio does offer lower risk, it also provides relatively low investment returns over long periods of time. One of the most important principles of investing is diversification. The old adage that we shouldn't have all our eggs in the same basket applies equally well to our personal investment portfolios, as well as the almost $162 billion CPP fund. We believe that we can create more investment income within the fund while balancing the risk we take by investing across a broad range of asset categories and geographies. For that reason, Uh, Since our inception, we've been systematically moving the fund away from its initial 100% concentration in bonds. And as you can see from the chart, we now have a broadly diversified portfolio by types of assets. And to achieve that diversification, we focus not just on stocks and, and bonds that are available through the public markets, but also on assets in the private markets as well. In the case of infrastructure and real estate, for example, the opportunity set afforded by private markets is vastly larger than that in the public markets. We now have almost 37% of the CPP fund, or nearly $60 billion, invested in private assets and are one of the largest investors globally in private equity, real estate, and infrastructure. We've also achieved significant geographic diversification of the fund. We still have approximately 40% or $65 billion of assets in Canada, including ownership positions in approximately 450 Canadian public companies. But Canada is a relatively small market. 
it represents less than three percent of global market capitalization so continued geographic diversification is a critical part of our strategy for success especially as we plan for the fund's future growth to 300 billion dollars and we're diversifying globally both to manage risk and to capitalize on the best investment opportunities we can find in all markets around the world. Six years ago, CPPIB transitioned away from what had previously been a primarily passive investment approach and adopted an active investment management strategy. One of the key reasons we did so was because we believed CPPIB had some very significant comparative advantages as an investor that would help us achieve returns over and above what a passive exposure to public markets would afford. One of the most important of those advantages is our long-term investment horizon. The multi-generational multi nature of the Canada Pension Plan allows CPPIB to be a patient and disciplined investor focusing on long-term value creation factors which is a very sharp contrast to the increasingly short-term orientation of most market participants. The fact that our asset base is stable, not subject to sudden withdrawals, and that we have reasonable certainty about the amount and timing of inflows into the fund provide great flexibility to our investing activities. And this is especially the case in times of market stress when we're able to be buyers of assets at attractive prices when others are forced to sell. The large size of the fund allows CPPIB to develop the sophisticated internal capabilities required to succeed at active investing. It also allows us to make large individual investments for which competition is less intense and positions us as a very attractive partner to other organizations in key markets around the world. We were very active on the investment front in this past fiscal year. We participated in a wide range of significant global transactions, including 60 private market investments across real estate, private equities, infrastructure, and private debt that we believe will deliver strong returns over the long term. Some of these investments are shown on this slide, and these examples also illustrate the global reach of our investing programs. CPPIB is also working to position itself for a world that is changing very rapidly. This slide shows how developing markets will capture the lion's share of future global GDP or gross domestic product growth. Indeed, China is on track to overtake the U.S. as the world's largest economy within the next decade. Now, Wayne Gretzky famously said he skated not to where the puck was, but where it would be. CPPIB is doing the same, but as prudent and disciplined investors. We're taking the time to build up our capabilities and understanding of developing markets, and at the same time building relationships with potential local investment partners so that we can take advantage of investment opportunities as these markets grow and mature. Over seven years ago, we were invited by the United Nations to help formulate the UN Principles for Responsible Investment. And it was a real privilege to be involved in helping to establish global standards in this area. And our own policy on responsible investing closely mirrors the objectives of those UN principles. At the core of this policy, which we adopted back in 2005, are two key beliefs. First, responsible behavior with respect to environmental, social, and governance factors, ESG for short can generally have a positive influence on long-term corporate financial performance. And secondly, 
Engagement is an effective strategy to encourage improved disclosure of and performance on ESG issues. Now, the goal of our engagement program is to encourage companies to share more information on the business risks related to ESG factors and what measures they are taking to better manage those risks. Our engagement activities, some of which we do in collaboration with other investors through initiatives such as these shown here, have had very positive results as we've seen companies not only disclose far more details about environmental issues, for example, including greenhouse gas emissions and water use, but also improve their operational practices in these areas as well. Now, I have mixed feelings as I wrap up today's presentation, as this will be my last public meeting as the CEO of this organization. It's been a great honor to serve as CEO of the CPP Investment Board over the last seven and a half years, during which the fund has doubled from $81.3 billion to $161.6 billion, and the organization has grown from 80 employees to over 800 worldwide. Mark Wiseman, our Executive Vice President Investments, has been appointed by the CPPIB Board of Directors as the incoming president and CEO upon my retirement at the end of June. And to all of you present at the St. John's Newfoundland meeting, I'd encourage you to say hello to Mark uh, as he's there with you. Now, I've worked with Mark for the past seven years, and he's played an integral role in creating and executing CPPIB's investment strategy. I can truly think of no one better able to lead this organization, and I'm confident that he will do an outstanding job in the years ahead. And now I'll turn the meeting back to Linda Sims. But Linda, before you do that, I wanted to turn to you, David, and to say on behalf of the Board of Directors of all of the employees of CPPIB, and indeed on behalf of all Canadians, a very heartfelt thank you to you for the amazing leadership you've shown in building this organization over the past seven and a half years. You can be proud of your legacy, and we're very proud of what you've done. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. And now back to Linda for the question and answer session. Thanks, Bob. Well, we hope that today's presentation was useful and that it provided you with a good understanding of our work at the CPP Investment Board and how we're delivering on our mandate to help sustain Canada's pension promise for 18 million Canadians. Now, should you want to revisit the presentation at any time, you'll be able to find it on our website. That's at www.cppib.ca. Well, we're now going to move to the question and answer period. Let me first recap how you can submit a question. Now, for those of you attending this meeting in person at one of our public meeting locations, you can ask a question by speaking directly to the CPPIB representative at your location or by filling out a question card and handing it to them. They will submit your question to us here in Toronto. And if you are joining us via the web, you can simply type your question in the comment box at the bottom of your screen. Now, we've already received a number of questions from people who had registered for the meetings on our website, and we'll be sure to include those today. Some of the questions have been addressing similar issues, and we may also see more duplication in the questions submitted today. In order to ensure that we address as many questions as possible during the webcast, we will consolidate some of them if they are similar in nature. And we'll do our best to cover as many questions as we can, but it may not be possible due to the time constraints to answer all of the questions we receive. Any that we can't get to today, we will reply to in writing following the meeting, as long as you provide contact information. Well, now let's get started. Our first question comes from Elizabeth, who's watching via the webcast. She wants to know, 
do you have any concerns about not being able to pay out the stated CPP amounts in the future? Or do you think government will just change the rules as they see fit, such as increasing the age at which you're entitled to receive CPP? Bob, I'll ask you to answer that one. Sure. As I, as I mentioned in my comments, Linda, the chief actuary assesses the sustainability of the Canada Pension Plan every three years, and he's continued to report that the, the plan is sustainable with the current benefits and the current contribution rate for 75 years, his projection period. But that's based on assumptions, of course, assumptions about such things as interest rates, investment returns, longevity, immigration, and a host of other factors. So we can, while we can have a high degree of confidence that the CPP benefits will be there for us, for our children, and our grandchildren, no one can make a guarantee. However, I would say in response to the second part of the question that no single government can simply change those benefits or alter the contribution rates. The formula for making any adjustments that would need to be required calls for a high degree of consensus among the federal government and the participating provinces. So no single government can unilaterally decide to, to make a change. And that's an important part of the protections that we as Canadians enjoy in CPP. So while I can't guarantee that there will never be any changes, I have a high degree of confidence, and so should you, Elizabeth, and all of the other listeners. Thank you, Bob. Oh, another question that has come in, um, questioning really where we invest. And, and David, I'll, I'll ask you this one, um, because in particular, a, a few people have asked us, why don't we invest more in Canada? Uh, well, I'd uh, f first reiterate, as, uh, as I mentioned in, uh, in my earlier remarks, we do have a, a lot of the fund invested in Canada. Indeed, we've got uh, uh, in excess of $65 billion uh, in, invested across uh, all sectors in, in this country. Um, but uh, again, I think there's uh, a, a few reasons for us uh, concentrating much, much, certainly not exclusively, our investing activity outside of Canada. One is, uh, and again, I referred to this earlier, uh, the, the size of Canada's markets. Um, at uh, less than 3% of the global market uh, capitalization, um, there uh, obviously is the majority of investing opportunities available to us outside of this country versus uh, inside uh, this country. Uh, and as well, as, even though there are lots of great uh, companies within Canada, uh, there are some sectors that uh, aren't well represented in the Canadian public markets. I'd, I'd point to uh, uh, sectors such as uh, healthcare, pharmaceuticals, uh, uh, technology as, uh, as examples. Um, in some uh, areas such as real estate, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the reality is most of the commercial real estate in this country is owned uh, by investors like CPPIB and other pension plans uh, that operate within this country. And, and those assets simply don't uh, turn over uh, very often, so it's, it's quite difficult to uh, add to our real estate uh, in investments. Um, and uh, another uh, factor that we take into account in, in our investing is the fact that uh, inflows into the Canada Pension Plan are very reliant on the state of the Canadian economy uh, contributions, of course, into the Canada Pension Plan are wage-based uh, contributions, uh, and so those uh, do uh, fluctuate in, in accordance with uh, how uh, Canada's economy is doing. So we actually think it's, it's uh, beneficial for us to diversify uh, the uh, CPP funds uh, concentration away from Canada uh, so that if there are times of cyclical downturns uh, that affect uh, Canada, uh, we can still be earning uh, good uh, returns and good flows uh, through our investing activity uh, in, uh, by concentrating on other countries and regions uh, around the world. Okay. Well, we're going to stay on this theme of, of how we invest, I think, because we've actually received a number of uh, similar questions from various locations today, as well as 
through the web by dealing with the sectors that we invest in and in particular asking about companies that manufacture military products and services. Why does CPPIB invest in these companies? Uh, well, uh, again, CPPIB is what I would call a universal investor. We, uh, we uh, truly do invest in, uh, in all sectors uh, and all geographies, as I pointed out uh, earlier uh, around the world. Um, and one thing that we explicitly do not do, um, I referred to our policy on responsible investing earlier. Our policy on responsible investing uh, makes it very clear that we do not screen out or eliminate uh, any particular sectors from our investing activity because of the nature of those sectors. Um, Linda, I guess uh, the question referred specifically to uh, armaments as, as one of those, uh, those sectors. And uh, I think that goes back to, uh, very clearly goes back to the mandate that we were uh, given, explicitly given as an investment organization at the time of our creation. Uh, in the late 1990s, and, and Bob, you, um, uh, you talked about this in, in your comments as well, that we have a, a very singular and clear investment mandate uh, that is to uh, achieve a maximum rate of return without undue risk of loss. And at the time that that mandate was created, um, the reformers of the Canada Pension Plan have very uh, clearly and explicitly deliberated uh, whether there should be other dimensions over and above that investment only aspect to our mandate. They did explicitly consider things like having a requirement to invest regionally across uh, Canada. And uh, as another consideration, they did explicitly consider whether we should have a socially responsible investing dimension to our mandate. Uh, and in both those instances and in all the other uh, potential additions to the mandate that they considered, they intentionally decided that we would uh, not be asked to take those kinds of considerations into account in making investment decisions. So that's why we, we say our very explicit and intentional mandate is singular investment orientation only. Now, as I as I did uh, also mention, uh, though, earlier, we do consider factors such as uh, uh, environmental, social, and, and governance factors uh, into our investing activities uh, to the extent that they do uh, impact the investment decisions, uh, the uh, risk and, and return from uh, the companies that we uh, invest. And in, in many instances, they absolutely do. Uh, particularly for a long horizon investor such as us. Um, so in those instances, we do take them into consideration. We do engage with companies, as I, um, as I also mentioned. I uh, do encourage uh, companies both to disclose and manage those risks uh, very, uh, very well. Uh, but we don't, uh, on an a priori basis, use those factors to screen out potential investments. David Perk yeah. and Linda, perhaps I could just add a word about that because this is, I think, uh, one of the, the questions that are on, on the minds of people uh, in Canada. And uh, I want to, to assure Canadians, too, that the Board of Directors is totally at ease with this policy and is, is very mindful that in every one of these areas where calls for so-called ethical investing are made, that there's always a contrary opinion. And the, the Board of Directors, mindful of our mandate, as David said, is, is quite uh, comfortable in investing with a singular focus on investment return, having regard for those ESG factors that you, you made, David. So uh, that, I think, is an important question that our, our listeners are asking. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to go back to you, David, for one more. Mm -hmm. This come in now from, uh, from Reg, uh, who's watching us from Fredericton. Um, and, and he's uh, just wondering about, you know, the funds starting to, to pay out in 2021. Where is the money being used now for benefit payments? Uh, well, thank you for that uh, question, Reg. R right now, uh, the CPP is in the situation where we have more contributions into the Canada Pension Plan 
then there are benefit uh, payments uh, required to be made. So, uh, so uh, the funding currently for benefit payments is, is really from contributions. Uh, and what happens in 2020 and in uh, subsequent years is, in addition to those contributions which keep coming in, uh, we will then use, initially it's a very, very small portion of the investment earnings that we generate through our activities uh, to help supplement those contributions to meet the benefit payment uh, needs. And over, over time, that proportion of investment earnings, annual investment earnings required to supplement contributions does go up, uh, but still, you know, well, well into the uh, into the foreseeable future, uh, not even 100% of the annual investment earnings uh, are required to actually supplement the, uh, the contributions. And that's, that's why the CPP fund continues to grow uh, well into the, uh, into the future. And just as a supplemental question, he's asking, do we know what percentage of the fund is in the form of available cash at present? Well, um, we, we keep uh, as little cash uh, on, on hand as is uh, re uh, required, uh, because obviously uh, cash doesn't uh, earn uh, uh, much of a, a re return for the, for the fund. Um, and so uh, we, we do have very good projections from the people in Ottawa who administer the CPP plan of what the uh, benefit uh, payment requirements are going to be uh, for months into the future, so we time our investing activities uh, around that so that we do have uh, sufficient cash on, on hand to make those payments. But in the interim, we, uh, we do want to be investing it so that we're, uh, again, maximizing the, uh, the, the re returns. And I'd say, um, you know, a, a fund as diverse as the Canada Pension uh, Plan Fund uh, of course, we're invested in uh, income-generating assets uh, such as bonds and, um, and re real estate where we earn rents and infrastructure where we earn uh, cash, uh, cash flows. Uh, so there's always ready amounts of cash that is coming into this fund. Uh, so sometimes we can just recycle that cash uh, right back out to make the payments or, as I say, invest it uh, temporarily and then... Uh, uh, and then convert it into cash at uh, a future date when we, we actually need to. Good, thank you. You mentioned the government, and our next question actually is about a different relationship with government. I'm going to put this one to you, Bob. Um, we have someone asking, does the government have access to CPP funds to be used to, say, get Canada out of an uh, economic emergency? Well, I think that's a very interesting and important question, uh, Linda because we have seen instances around the world where that has happened. And one instance that comes to mind is Ireland, where the government of Ireland did actually dip into the National Pension Plan Fund to help uh, the, the economy weather the financial crisis. Whether that was good policy or bad policy, I'll leave to the Irish to decide. But in Canada, that is simply not possible within the construct of the the Canada Pension Plan and the CPPIB Act, and a very intentionally so. That was the way the designers set up uh, the arrangement. I, I would remind our viewers and our listeners that every dollar in the CPP fund comes from contributions from, from Can working Canadians or their employers, or as David said, from investment earnings on the fund, which have been quite substantial there is not a single dollar of tax revenue in that fund. So it's quite appropriate that that fund be totally restricted to accumulating for the purpose of paying future pension benefits. That's it. That's it. Okay. End of the question. Good. Well, here comes the next one that's come in from Elizabeth in Toronto via the web. Uh, she's asking, what is the current fixed income allocation in the Canada Pension Plan? And given current low interest rates, where are you finding good bond investments? David? Uh, well, the uh, p policy allocation that we, uh, we have to fixed income is 35% uh, of, um, of the fund. Um, 
But uh, let me explain how we actually achieve that, that 35 percent. Some of it uh, absolutely is in the form of uh, bonds. Uh, a big portion of that uh, is in the form of legacy uh, provincial bonds that uh, used to be the only al allowable investment for the Canada Pension Plan uh, back uh, pre-reforms. Pre um, but uh, what we have been doing uh, over uh, the past six years in, in particular is achieving the broader diversification that I, I uh, talked about uh, in my comments a few minutes ago. And what we have been doing is um, investing in assets like real estate, uh, infrastructure, uh, private, uh, private corporate debt, uh, and we see uh, elements, the, the vast majority of those kinds of investments as actually being bond substitutes. And what we've been doing uh, to invest in real estate, uh, for instance, is sell down our bond holdings and put that, uh, the, those monies into uh, buildings uh, such as the ones I, uh, ones I talked about earlier. And similarly, in infrastructure, we see better uh, returns in uh, private corporate debt than we are, are seeing uh, for sovereign uh, debt, uh, debt around, uh, around the world. So while we say that we have a 35% allocation to fixed income, the way we actually achieve that is much uh, broader diversification than simply being in bonds. And we think we get uh, a much better re returns for uh, taking commensurately a little bit more risk um, by investing in those categories. But we think the fund is well positioned uh, now, uh, despite the, uh, as, as you point out, the, uh, the current historically low uh, rates of re return on uh, particularly government uh, bonds in, in the fund. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're going to stay on the um, question of, of how we invest and where we invest. We have uh, Marvin, who's at the Regina meeting, who is asking, there are a large number of pools of money that compete for opportunities to invest and park their money for the best rate of return possible, which is what you were talking about in part. But what he's asking is, is it becoming more difficult to find investments for funds the size uh, of that managed by the CPPIB? Could this become a serious problem. As he points out, he says, after all, you can only track a limited number of investments. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's, a, it's an, an uh, excellent question, Marvin. Thank you for, uh, for asking it. Uh, um, we, we do not uh, see uh, the current size nor the uh, projected size of the CPP fund in uh, the foreseeable future as a uh, constraint, as it were, or an impediment uh, to us as, as an investor. Uh, quite, uh, quite the opposite. Uh, as I commented earlier, we actually see the, the scale uh, at 162 billion, um, growing to almost 300 billion or so within the next eight to ten years, as an advantage uh, to us as an investment organization. It does, though, uh, go back to the uh, you know one of the earlier questions: Why not invest more in Canada? Uh, as long as we are looking, as we do around the world, in all markets, for the, the best opportunities that we can find uh, to invest in for the, the fund, we, we, we see uh, a rich opportunity set for us to, uh, to take advantage of. Um, we do try uh, to focus our investing activities on larger uh, individual in investments, and I think that's uh, one of the points you make in, in your question, uh, Marvin, uh, because every investment that we do make, we do have to track, and that requires uh, the time and attention of people within the organization. So our bias is to focus on large investments versus small uh, investments. Um, we, we do find them uh, in all markets uh, uh, around the, the, the world, in developing markets as well as developed markets. And we will add people, the required people, to the organization to make sure that once we have made an investment, we have the, uh, the right oversight uh, in place to make sure that that investment is being managed properly to, to give us the returns that we, uh, 
uh, that we're seeking for the, uh, for the fund. But we do think it is a very, very scalable model that we have within the CPPIB. Good, thank you. Thanks for that question. Um, we have a question that's come in from Craig. He's joined us at the, from the Victoria meeting. Um, and he's asking about uh, the, the passive strategy. He says, what percentage of the portfolio is invested in passive strategies? Are multiple passive strategies other than market capitalization utilized? And how are ESG policies applied when passive strategies are used? Uh, well, uh, again, thank you for, uh, for, for that question. We, we, we do have a sizable amount of the fund in, invested uh, passively. That will uh, vary uh, at any point in time, but about 45 to 50 percent uh, uh, invested uh, passively. And, uh, and that is um, the, the way we handle cash flows uh, coming into the uh, CPP fund. Uh, we get cash flows weekly into the fund, we instantly invest them passively so that they are uh, immediately uh, doing the, the work uh, we want them to do uh, in uh, the capital markets uh, uh, where they get invested around the world. Um, and that, uh, that ap approach is one of the reasons why we can scale the, the investing activities uh, so significantly in, in, in the future, because that is a very, very efficient and cost-effective way to, uh, to invest assets in, in the fund. We have been primarily uh, market cap weighted uh, or market cap approach to, uh, uh, to our passive investing, uh, but we are implementing uh, in this current fiscal year other ways of passive in investing. Some of you may have uh, heard of alternatives such as fundamental indexing uh, versus market capitalization uh, indexing. So we will be uh, expanding our passive investing in, uh, in a variety of different approaches. Um, and from an ESG uh, uh, point of view, uh, we do uh, take um, into account ESG factors in uh, all of the passive investing we do. It, it does cause us to own a, a lot of companies uh, both within Canada and around the world. Um, but here's uh, where our engagement uh, process comes, uh, comes to, the, to the fore. We do look at those companies, even if we are, are owning them just uh, through passive exposure, we want to uh, make sure that they are uh, disclosing and managing their ESG risks appropriately. Uh, and so we, uh, we engage with them either individually uh, uh, directly or, uh, again, as I mentioned, sometimes in collaboration with other investors uh, or, or around the world. Sometimes it's most effective to work with partners uh, w in the countries where those uh, companies are domiciled, uh, for instance. Good, thank you. Um, just one more about the, the ESG factors that we follow. Timothy has asked us via the webcast um, the following question. He says, I worry about rising environmental risks in the Canadian oil, utility, and material sectors. What measures are being taken to hedge against these risks? Uh, well, uh, you know, what, what, first off, I would, um, I would go back to our theme of diversification and how important it is as an investment organization to d diversify uh, our investing activities. So yes, we do, uh, obviously, uh, through our uh, $65 billion invested in Canada, we do own uh, interests in uh, companies that operate in the sectors that, uh, that you've uh, identified. Um, but we own lots of companies operating in uh, th those same sectors uh, out outside of Canada. So uh, it is not that we're only uh, taking into uh, uh, account companies that operate in, uh, in materials or in the energy sectors um, in, in this country. And, and uh, again, we, we do, um, uh, as, as I say, pay close attention, particularly to Canadian uh, companies, uh, uh, in, in how they are managing those, those risks. And I, I, I think you're um, uh, correct in saying that the, the risks are becoming more apparent, uh, perhaps in, in increasing over, over time. So we do uh, look to those companies to 
be able to assure us through their disclosure, uh, through uh, the meetings that we sometimes request with them, the interactions we have with them, that they are aware of those risks, they are properly characterizing them and disclosing them so investors like us can, uh, can uh, take them into account, and most importantly, how are they managing those risks? And that's what we've seen. Part of the benefit of our engagement activities has been uh, we, we've seen as companies are challenged to articulate the risks they're facing and disclose them, they also uh, realize that they have to take, in many cases, better measures to manage those risks. And so it's been a very virtuous circle that we've seen uh, with respect to how we have engaged these companies in addressing the, uh, the risks that you've referred to in your question. Thank you, David. We've got a question for Bob um, asking, this is uh, from Peter in Toronto, joined us via the web, and he asks, how are your directors selected? Do you have any international board members or are they all Canadians, and do they represent various regions of Canada? I'll have to give a, a bit of a long answer to that to describe the director appointment process, Linda. Uh, given the importance, though, of the board of directors, I, I do agree that this is a, a vital, vital topic. The 12-person board of directors plays an incredibly important role in the governance of CPPIB and ensuring that the, the aims of the CPPIB Act and the, the stewards are, are carried out. But let me talk a little bit about how formally the directors are appointed and then I'll back up a little bit to, to talk about how those uh, individuals are, are named. Uh, formally, the directors are appointed by the Federal Minister of Finance, who has already at that time consulted with his or her counterparts in the participating provinces. So that consultation process would, would take some time. So how do those names come forward to the Federal Minister of Finance in the first place. Uh, well, the, the board number is 12, and directors are appointed for terms of typically three years, and then they come up for reappointment and can typically serve for, for nine years, so three three-year terms. When a vacancy occurs, uh, CPPIB board, the existing directors, uh, considers with the aid of a, an outside governance expert what competencies would be required in, in that person in order to supplement the current board to make it the most effective. Uh, we then hire uh, a search firm to identify individuals. There's an interviewing process and we actually take back to an external nominating committee uh, names of qualified individuals having reviewed with them the requirements for this particular vacancy. And they, this external nominating committee, which has representatives of all of the provinces and includes both public sector and private sector individuals, grills us about those recommendations, considers them, and if they find them appropriate, forwards them to the Federal Minister of Finance. And then as I said, the Federal Minister of Finance consults with, with uh, his or her counterparts and makes the appointment. That's how the directors are, are, are found. Now, there were some other questions, I believe. I hope I, I remember them all. First of all, uh, are all of the directors Canadians? And the answer is that the CPPIB Act requires that the directors be resident Canadians. So that is the requirement. I will say, though, that international experience, given the kinds of investment trajectory that CPPIB is on, is becoming incredibly important. So many of the directors have had experience internationally in their professional careers or in their businesses. That's becoming an even more important part of the, the skill set. And uh, I also believe there's a question about regional That's right. representation. I think it's important to stress that any one of us directors do not represent a region of the country. We don't represent Canada in the sense that we, we only are concerned about Canadian investments. We represent the Canadian 
contributors and beneficiaries and the best interests of the fund so when we sit down together as a group of twelve with management we are thinking about the best interests of the fund and not about any regional consideration so that is the, the requirement David what have I missed there well it's just in, in that um, in in that regard we we do draw directors from the various regions Quite across we do. across Canada um, by, by residency uh, but to, to your point Bob they don't uh, represent those regions uh, per se but, uh, but we did want to have that uh, that broad um, you know pool of, of candidates for uh, director selection right. from across the country good thank you all right um, I'll stick with you uh, David for this next question this comes from Joe in Toronto he's asking if you could provide an estimate of the cost of managing the CPP and he said please provide an all-in cost which includes administration costs outside of investment management okay uh, well uh, thank you uh, again for that question Joe our internal costs to uh, manage the CPP fund are about uh, t 28 basis points uh, or 0.28 percent of the uh, the assets that we uh, the, that we manage uh, um, so that uh, includes all of the uh, management uh, t uh, team we have about 830 people within the organization uh, includes the cost of uh, the board of directors uh, you know ha having meetings like this and uh, publishing our annual report and, and all of those uh, those uh, costs uh, over and above that we do engage uh, external managers uh, to invest some of the funds on our behalf so uh, including all of those uh, uh, costs the uh, the fees that we we pay uh, our all in costs would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 to uh, 60 basis points. It, it will vary uh, in any given year uh, what the, those costs uh, amount to. Uh, and certainly with the external managers that we do engage to uh, invest some of, some of the fund, uh, we do try wherever possible to structure those arrangements to be performance fee based versus uh, say a, a management fee which is paid irrespective of how they uh, they perform on, on behalf of CPP uh, plan members uh, and so uh, if they do an extremely good job and uh, deliver uh, lots of returns the uh, the costs uh, that uh, that we incur for engaging them will be higher we think that's a good thing uh, because the benefit is very clear and apparent uh, for the 18 million Canadians whose money we, we manage. Um, but it is also why I say at any point in time the, uh, the overall aggregate costs uh, will, will vary. But 55 to 60 is a, uh, is a reasonable estimate. Okay. okay, thanks for that, David. I'm going to stick with you for a moment because we've also been asked, how do you select the assets you want to invest in and how do you select investment managers? It's a big question, but perhaps you can okay. provide a few points. Um, so, well, why don't I, maybe I'll start with the investment manager uh, process, and then I'll, um, I'll I'll use that as the basis for talking about the individual assets as well. Um, so we have dedicated teams within our uh, investment uh, areas uh, within CPPIB who focus on um, identifying and engaging uh, external money managers uh, on on behalf of the CPP fund, and. Um, that can be uh, managers who uh, operate within the public markets um, or managers that operate in private markets like private equity uh, or um, uh, real estate uh, to, to some extent. So uh, what we tend to do, let me uh, I'll give um, maybe a couple of uh, examples where we would engage those kinds of managers. Say in public market investing, uh, it might be a field such as managers who specialize in commodity I investing. So we would uh, we have a team that would identify the universe of managers who operate in that particular skill set. Uh, they, that would be in the public markets. Um, comparable in private equity would be, say, mid-sized companies in the uh, private equity buyout uh, uh, arena. 
so we try and identify all the uh, managers who operate in, in, that, uh, in, in those spheres as examples. Uh, we apply some filters at the, the front end uh, to reduce the size. Some of those filters might be the size of the, uh, the assets under management. We try and orientate ourselves to larger um, in investment managers versus the very small ones. Uh, for a fund our size, that would be uh, problematic. Um, what their track record uh, has been, uh, for instance, so a variety of, of screens uh, or filters. And we get down to uh, a pool of uh, prospective managers uh, that uh, seem to be interested, uh, interesting to us. We'll do fairly extensive reviews of those managers. Again, filter it down to a, a smaller subset. Uh, and at that point, we will have our teams go out, uh, meet with them, uh, and do fairly exhaustive um, analyses of their uh, capabilities. At least those managers tell us it's fairly exhaustive uh, from, from their side. Uh, so we may start with um, universes of 100 and end up in this latter stage with seven or eight managers that were being a very uh, uh, comprehensive on in our analysis. And when we visit them, what are we looking for? Um, obviously, we can see what their track record has, has been. Uh, but we're, what we're looking for is, what is their investment process? How do they make investment decisions? Uh, what are their sources of advantage? Uh, can we identify some skill uh, in what they do? Uh, we uh, you know, assess how they demonstrate that skill. Uh, we consider, is it? Um, a persistent skill? Do we have confidence that it will continue into, into the future? Um, is it scalable? Uh, if we add more money to, to their fund, could they uh, uh, continue to invest that and earn those, those kinds of, uh, of, of returns? We look at their risk management practices. We do a very comprehensive operational review to make sure that they have strong uh, capabilities in that very important respect. So in any event, what we're trying to, to, to do is to identify those uh, small subset of managers that we uh, have confidence in, truly have a, an investment process which is well-defined, uh, that has elements of skill to it, is well-controlled, uh, and we believe will have persistence uh, going, uh, going forward. And it's those managers that we uh, will then allocate some, some monies to. Um, and if we're looking at individual assets uh, where we're the direct investor, as we are in um, many instances, let's say it's a building or uh, an infrastructure asset or a company and, uh, that we're going to make a private investment into, uh, you know, we are looking at, you know, the similar kinds of um, uh, factors that I've, I've just talked about. What is the competitive positioning of those assets or companies? Um, you know, what, uh, how, how do we see the cash flows being generated into, into the future? What confidence do we have uh, with the um, uh, prediction of those cash flows? Uh, um, what, what's the strength of management teams? Uh, and in those kinds of instances, what we're trying to, uh, to, to do is to make uh, a, uh, an investment, identify a, a price or a value which will give us a good risk-adjusted return uh, for investing in those, in those companies. Uh, and because the price is very, very important that you pay uh, to acquire those assets. And, and Bob will attest uh, to, to this because the board uh, sees uh, our investing activity and has seen it over, over years. Uh, we have identified lots of potentially attractive uh, investment opportunities, been part of bidding uh, processes. Uh, but when the price gets beyond what we think is good risk-adjusted value for the fund, we stop. Uh, and that we, we think it's really very important for us to be a disciplined uh, investor, not, uh, not simply acquiring the assets at whatever price it takes. David, if I could add to that, it's, it's a, an incredibly important point, the last one you made. The, the board of directors in evaluating the performance of management does not give any weight to the amount of investments. This is not a volume uh, activity that we're trying to incent. 
what the compensation system, which is overseen by the board of directors, looks at is the added value which management uh, uh, injects into the fund over a long period of time. So that is the key criterion. It's not just simply making more investments and anything that might uh, come our way. It's selecting the right investments that are going to create value for the fund. And uh, it's a singular focus of the management we know. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to stay with you for a moment, Bob, because uh, we have uh, June from Waterloo, who's uh, written in uh, via the web. She asks, how can Canadians be confident that your board of directors is operating in our best interests entirely free from government influence or interference? Well, I can provide assurance and, and give you some specifics. Uh, first of all, uh, the appointment process is such that, that we bring forward only people who are very, very well qualified to serve on the board. And I can tell you that every one of the 12 individuals, and I'll count myself in that, uh, are acting on this board because we have a genuine sense of, of mission and purpose in serving our fellow Canadians. I would also say that each of us is bound by our code of conduct, which we talk about regularly within the board and with management, which uh, ensures that we have no conflicts of interest with respect to the activities of CPPIB, that we act in a completely impartial manner. Indeed, uh, there is a duty on each of us. If there is ever any attempt at political interference, we are obliged to report it to the board. And I'm pleased to say there never has been. So uh, I am very, very confident and totally comfortable that the board is acting in the best interests of Canadians to the best of our ability, as is the management team. One of the roles of the board of directors is to assess the tone at the top of CPPIB. And I can say without hesitation that it's an incredibly highly principled organization, and I know that everyone aims to keep it that way. Good. Thanks so much, Bob. David, I'm going to turn back to you. Sarah in Regina has uh, written in. She said that in your presentation, you said the fund doubled in size from $80 billion, roughly. Uh, you stated a surplus of contributions over pay cuts. How much of that $80 billion that's increased in your time was due to CPP contributions from citizens? Um, geez, I, d I don't have that no. exact uh, number from uh, from you, uh, uh, Sarah. With, uh, Sandra, but, but Sandra, you do know. But, uh, I think we know how much of the fund, as it sits now, is from contributions and how well, much. Well, if, if we go back ten years, I did. Yeah. Uh, I did cite that number. That uh, if we go back uh, ten years in in uh, time, uh, when. Uh, the, uh, the, the about 37 percent of the increase in the fund's assets to where it is today, um, and that's roughly six, $60 billion, uh, has come from our investing activities. Uh, and, uh, and the balance, of, of, of course, is uh, a combination of existing assets at, at that point in time and, uh, and contributions. Uh, but the uh, I'd say as we look uh, forward, the, the fund's growth is going to be primarily driven by investment uh, re returns. Even over these next uh, nine years or eight, nine years or so, where there will continue to be surplus contributions coming in, uh, the, the majority will be investment returns, as we saw last year, uh, for instance, in the uh, overall increase in, in the, the fund. Uh, the vast majority, almost $10 billion of that increase, was in in fact, due to the investment returns and the smaller proportion because of contribution uh, surpluses. Good. Thank you. Uh, Kevin, who is at the London meeting, is asking if, as many Canadians are hoping, governments across the country agree to a phased-in increase in the premiums in return for a more meaningful monthly payout, a CPP payout in retirement, would this create any problems for the CPPIB? Um, it, it would not create uh, problems from our vantage point. So this question is pointing out should the uh, uh, 
uh, should the uh, stewards of the CANA pension plan uh, agree to in increase the benefit levels uh, uh, going, going forward? Obviously, contributions would have to increase in order to uh, pay for that. Uh, could, we, could we manage those? Uh, and the, the answer is absolutely. We have built the CPPIB organization understanding that we have to accommodate a doubling of the fund over the next eight to ten years and then another doubling of the fund in terms of its size over the subsequent decade or, uh, uh, or, or so. So all, all of our planning and thinking about how to organize CPPIB has been uh, to ensure that we can handle big scale uh, investing activities. So if that scale comes a little earlier, th uh, which would be the case in, uh, if uh, CPP um, enhancements were, uh, were implemented, uh, we, we can handle, uh, handle that. Um, and one of the very efficient ways that we handle it, I'll go back to the uh, question that was asked earlier about passive investing, is as, as soon as money, money's come into the CPPIB, we do invest them uh, passively. Um, that is uh, done at uh, extremely low cost. It's, uh, perhaps it's not infinitely scalable, but it's, it's um, sc scalable uh, uh, well beyond uh, what, uh, what we see in terms of the, uh, the needs of the CPP fund in the next 20, 40 years. Um, and we only take it out of those passive investings when we do identify uh, the, you know, the good real estate and private equity and private debt and infrastructure uh, uh, investments, as I've, I've uh, pointed out we did last year. So, uh, again, it's uh, n not an issue for, uh, for us. And, uh, and certainly in my meetings with the uh, provincial finance ministers and the federal finance minister, where this question has come up, and it has uh, from them, um, I've uh, conveyed that message that uh, we, we can certainly handle uh, additional assets. Good. Thank you. All right. I'm going to uh, address this next one to you, Bob. This has come in from uh, Kevin in Victoria. Uh, and he writes, it's rather lengthy, so I will read it. He writes, I'm concerned about the many CPP investments in military weapons companies. I know we've addressed this before, but he wants to point to, to one example, if you'll uh, take the time. There is one investment in particular, which I'm very concerned about. This is CPP's investment in CAE, Inc. CAE is the world leader in building military flight simulation trainers, in particular, trainers for the UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter gunship pilots. Now this fact is of interest to me as I was on board the humanitarian aid ships, the Mavi Marmara, on May 31st, 2010, when Israeli forces attacked our ship in international waters using three UH-60 helicopter gunships. And nine aid workers were killed, 54 others were wounded, three Canadians on board, including myself, were injured and almost killed. These helicopter gunship pilots were trained by CAE Inc. In my view, CPP shouldn't be investing in war industries, let alone in war equipment used to attack Canadian citizens. Is this profit at any cost? It's complicated, but I wonder if you'd take a stab at it. Well, the first thing I would say in, in response to Kevin is that this kind of tragedy uh, impacts us all on, on many different levels. And to, to, uh, to say, well, that's none of our concern is, of course, a wrong answer because it's the concern of all of us. It is a public policy issue. And, you know, one can trace the chain of events to many, many different things. In the particular case of the company that Kevin was, is referring to, that activity is viewed by society in Canada and in elsewhere as a legitimate uh, activity of creating uh, systems, weapons, and uh, it is viewed and regulated accordingly. As David has, has said in response to some uh, earlier questions, we do not screen out investments. We take into account these environmental, social, and governance factors. We engage with companies, uh, but we do not screen them. That is, I think, the ultimate right course. But that's not to deny that bad things do happen in the world and that individuals and companies can be involved in them to a, 
a, a small extent, a peripheral extent, uh, but we, we do not make those kinds of judgments in screening. Okay. I'm going to come back to you, uh, David, with a question. And it's a bit technical, so you'll have to help me out with this. Uh, this is from Jerry in uh, Nova Scotia in Annapolis, who has written in, Do your risk models remain based on the classic, normally distributed market variations, or do they account for exponential trends that better reflect reality? Uh, well, that's a, that is a technical question, and, uh, but thank you for it. Um, uh, what, uh, what I would say is that we, uh, we utilize a variety of different uh, risk models uh, to try and, uh, and simulate and capture as best we possibly can uh, the, what we think are the true underlying uh, risks involved with any singular investment or investment program. We do continue to, uh, to use... Uh, uh, you know, normalized uh, risk models is one of the tools within our uh, toolbox. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that's, uh, those are called uh, value at risk uh, kinds of, of uh, models. Um, uh, you know, we, we think we gain some insights uh, from, uh, from the use of those, those kinds of models. But what we don't do is singularly rely on a single model or a single view of risk to um, inform all of our in, uh, in investing decisions and uh, our analysis of, of uh, underlying portfolio risk. So we do uh, lots of uh, si simulations, lots of uh, uh, crash uh, tests of, um, of the uh, uh, investments. We are trying to identify um, where the, you know, what's, what's called the tail risks or the extreme event risks uh, might, uh, might lie in our investments and what circumstances might uh, prompt those risks to actually materialize. So our view is uh, that uh, uh, as many different uh, sources and analyses as we possibly can have on un underlying investments and underlying investment programs help us make informed, better informed decision uh, about risk. And we uh, certainly recognize uh, the shortcomings of having a singular uh, risk model, such as uh, va value at risk. If, that, if that's the only uh, way an organization is trying to capture risk, we, we would agree with the underlying premise of your question that 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 uh, is, is not reflecting reality uh, at, at all. And we, we certainly do not do that. Good. Thank you. Um, Bob, I have uh, Heather at the Victoria meeting asking you, uh, how are you going to handle the change in demographics in Canada? I think looking just for a bit more information on that. If based on contributions and these increase due to the higher number of retirees? Well, this is a, all part of what the chief actuary projects. The chief actuary's projections, which the CPPIB staff uh, are, are, are intimately familiar with, uh, make projections and assumptions about longevity, about the, the proportion of men and women in the workforce at different ages, about immigration, uh, about uh, employment rates, all of those factors that impact the the, the health of the, the fund going forward and the sustainability of the plan, as well as, of course, the investment return assumptions that, that David has spoken about uh, in considerable detail. So uh, the fact that baby boomers are going to be entering the retirement corridor quite soon is well understood and built into the model. And indeed, the chief actuary does vary the assumptions to understand the sensitivity. One of the interesting ones that potentially can have a significant effect is the level of immigration, the number of workers who are coming into the country from outside and making contributions and earning benefits. Anyway, to make a long story short, this is all taken into account by the chief actuary in his projections the chief actuary does look at different variations on those assumptions. He gets expert opinion to assess whether those assumptions are a reasonable reflection of outcomes. And on that basis, 
he is still able to confirm that the plan remains sustainable over the 75-year lifetime. Good, thank you. Well, we just have a few minutes left, but I am going to uh, ask you, David, to address one issue that a number of people have asked about, and that is the, the problems in Europe right now and the concerns about the global economy. Uh, asking, you know, if you could just talk about what our strategy, CPPIB strategy, would be to deal with a possible Euro meltdown, for example. Uh, yes, well, uh, you know, again, we've, we've done some simulations uh, for the portfolio uh, in the event of a uh, of some kind of, uh, you, you know, to your, your phrase, Eurozone uh, meltdown, whatever precipitates that, uh, uh, perhaps the election in, in Greece um, on, on Sunday, uh, uh, next Sunday, or uh, uh, a default in Spain, or whatever the, the case might be. So, so we, we continue, uh, and we will continue to, to, to do that and, and uh, look and see uh, how the fund is uh, positioned. Uh, we are absolutely comfortable uh, with our current uh, exposures uh, within uh, the Eurozone. We do not have any uh, Eurozone sovereign bonds in the um, uh, portfolio at, uh, at, at this point. Um, and I, you know, earlier in, in my uh, comments, I, I mentioned two, two of our advantages as an investor. One is a long investment horizon. So it is very difficult for any of us, ourselves included, to uh, understand what might happen over the next three to six to nine, even uh, 12 and 24 months uh, in, in Europe. Uh, we do our best to, as I say, to simulate uh, those, those risks, but, um, but it is impossible to actually uh, for, for tell them with accuracy. But one of the advantages we have is that we are investing not just for the next three, six, nine, 12, 24 months, we are literally investing for the next 10 and 20 years. And uh, we, we do have the ability to withstand some short-term volatility in the fund, uh, returns, uh, uh, volatility in the fund, um, for an event like, uh, like a, a Eurozone a breakup, for, for instance. In fact, uh, I also mentioned in times of stress, um, a long horizon investor like us with certainty of our underlying asset base, this will actually present opportunities for us as an investor. We saw it in 2008 and 2009 during the global financial crisis uh, when uh, many owners, other investors and owners of assets uh, had to sell. Uh, and had to sell at whatever price it took to, uh, to uh, tra transact. Uh, uh, we actually think that should that uh, transpire, should there be uh, some stress within uh, Europe, the same thing is going to happen. There will be very good assets coming onto the market uh, at prices that we think will be compelling risk-adjusted uh, values for the fund. Uh, that will play out over 10, 20, uh, 30 years. And that's the time frame we should be operating uh, within uh, because we have a, f uh, a very strong and fundamental um, advantage over the vast majority of short horizon in investors who can't take those views, quite frankly. Good. Well, thank you very much. Well, I'm afraid that's uh, all the time we have. David and Bob, thank you both for all of those answers. And thank you to everyone who joined us for this uh, 2012 public meeting, whether it was in person or on the web. We do appreciate your participation. And, you know, we hope this was an informative session. Now, for those who are interested, this broadcast is going to be posted on CPPIB's website, and that website address again is www.cppib.ca, and uh, that will be up sometime in the coming days, so look for that if you want to look at that. Now, we were not able to get to all of the questions that we had today, but for anyone who submitted a question that did not get answered during our formal broadcast here, we will endeavor to respond to you in the coming weeks. So what we would ask is that you ensure that you have provided us, either at the meeting or through the web, with the contact information that we need to be able to do that. Again, thank you all for joining us, and goodbye.